Hello and welcome to a new series of Train Spotting. In this program, I get my hands on some heavy metal in the company of a heavy metal legend, Bruce Dickinson of Iron Maiden. New boy Steve is also at the controls on what has to be the ultimate in computer simulation, but only gets to stand in awe on one of the first tilt runs in this country for 30 years. And I relive more teenage hero worship at the feet of one of my favourite class of diesels, the Peaks. You may remember in the first series of train spotting my day at the Avon Valley Railway where I learnt to drive one of their 060 tank engines that they have there. Excellent day, fantastic fun, had by all. But I've decided to take it a step further and drive something a bit bigger. So I've come to the Bluebell Railway in Sussex where I teamed up with a hero of mine, Bruce Dickinson, who as well as being lead singer of Iron Maiden has retrained as a commercial airline pilot and also happens to be a train fanatic. Hello, Mark. How are you? Yes, I'm doing very well. Shall we go? Let's go. Come on, Bruce. Can't wait to get my hands on a shovel. So, Bruce, I know you're an airline pilot now, but when did your uh, interest in trains first begin? Um, Grandad was a coal miner. I lived with my granddad in, in Worksop, which is up, up north-ish. And we used to go down to Worksop Station and sit and watch the steam trains hammer through. I believe the Flying Scotsman used to come through there at one point. Uh, anyway, sitting on, the, on, the, on the, the footbridge over the top and just standing there and getting covered in smoke. Clive Groom and John Padgham were to be our driver instructor team and Clive immediately set us to oiling our loco for the day, the magnificent Blackmoor Vale. So that's a feeder, not an oil can. OK. And there's your cloth for taking the corks out. Right. If you run out of oil, give us a shot. OK. The engineers that... to do this, you know, on the, on the, on the aeroplanes. <laughs> now, I did mention that you are a, um, an airline pilot these days, Bruce. Of course, you're still with Iron Maiden. Yeah. There's an old championship fencer as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there any string to your bow that you haven't tried I in life? I always wanted to be an engine driver. <laughs> when I was a kid, I always wanted to be an engine driver yeah. or an astronaut. How did you get into flying <laughs> aeroplanes then? Well, I just started on little itty-bitty tiddler ones and, and, and eventually I thought, well, uh, I ended up flying the band around, in fact. Did you? Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I flew the band around. I was sort of like their, their pilot for a while. So I thought, well, try and get, the, try and get a proper job. And I've wow. never had a proper job, actually. You're also a broadcaster <laughs> these days for the Beeb, aren't you? Uh, yeah, I do, I do uh, just uh, three hours a week. Are you still Ooh, writing? I don't get any time to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just a, I'm just about to write my own name. Clive. Oh, good. You are all oiled in the correct places. You didn't miss a court. No. Right, so what's the next thing? Right, well, I'm going to run through the controls with you. The driver's controls first. Right. OK, so at the moment... Now, we obviously had to pay careful attention to Clive's though, briefing before one. Bruce was let loose with 128 tons of heavy metal. That's it. And then pull on that. Hey! OK, shut the regulator now. Try and keep it open. Lovely. Now, I was hoping to have a chat with Bruce whilst all this was going on, but he was concentrating so hard that I daren't interrupt. Next, it was my turn to take the controls. Now, I'm going to test you out by asking you now to go back into the siding and actually buffer up to some coaches. All oh, right, it's going to be really good. Slow, slow, slow. Pull on. OK, nice and smooth. And we're on. Ah, OK, right. so we'll go down and uh, hook on. Jolly good. Blimey, that's heavy. Whoa. Right, OK. And yep. keeping your fingers where they won't get pinched, yep. put it over the coach hook. That's it. Right, OK. okay. Right, so onto the shovel, look back. You get there? That's it, now have a look, see where it went. Not bad. Not bad. Have another go, Good yeah, go. that's it. Go on then. Imagine doing this on a winter's day where your hands are freezing cold. Ah, yes. Lovely, well done, well done. Ah. OK, right, let's go.
I'll tell you what, it was cracking. Did you enjoy it? I really did, yeah. Excellent. Yeah, yeah could you tell? <laughs> yeah, I could actually. Although you were very studious when it came to actually opening the regulator a few times. Oh, yeah, I'm afraid old habits die hard, you know. It's like as soon as, soon as somebody sits you in the seat and says, here's 115 tonnes, yeah. you know, I, I, I get a bit serious. What was the best part, do you think? The best bit, just getting the thing into a nice, getting, getting the thing moving and getting it into a nice stride. Yeah. And just getting getting it to where the regulator is just sitting there and you've got the right amount of steam, you got a nice constant speed and just chug -in, chug -in, and you get a right, nice rhythm going. There's a real knack to it, there yeah. really is, and I haven't got there yet. Yeah, Very impressive. Going on. Yeah, Excellent. I was, I was well, impressed. It's great to meet you. Yep. The best. Glad you've had a good day. Yes, indeed. I've always loved trains. Ever since I was a kid, I had this burning ambition to drive one. Closest I ever got was riding on the footplate at a Steam Gull Open Day when I was 10. But now, my chance has come. Well, obviously, I'm not going to be allowed to drive this one, but I am off to the Virgin Trains Training Centre and crew to have a go on the next best thing. Colin Campbell's the man in charge of Virgin's Driver Training College, and he gave me an outline of the impressive new facilities that have been installed. Basically, we have three simulators here for Virgin Trains fleet for um, cross country and west coast. Uh, we have a west coast simulator for the Pendolinos, and we have two uh, simulators for the Voyager fleet as well. Why the need for a training centre? Well, it's important, obviously, with a high speed railway that we're operating in Virgin that um, we give the best training possible to our drivers. And the drivers, when they come here, what do they have to do? Well, we have to go through some theory training on the systems on the new trains and also um, putting through the paces in the cab of the actual simulators themselves to get them familiar with the controls and how everything works in the train that they're going to learn about. And after we've done that, one of the key things, obviously, is to go out and drive the real train under supervision so you can actually feel what the train's like in real life. It's an £8 million investment here at Crewe. What have you got for your money? Right, well, we're in the uh, observation room just now and we're at the control workstation where the instructor actually controls what we're doing on the uh, simulator itself. Uh, what we have is the ability to have a virtual reality 3D graphic of a, a real railway. The other thing we also have is a virtual instrument so we can see around the whole cab of the Pendolino. There's lots of controls on the cab and we want to see in detail what buttons the driver's pressing and what controls are being operated. We also have a screen where we can actually um, control the railway where we can be the signaller, but we can also control the weather and create the events which we want to actually test the driver on. And one of the key parts of the simulator here, certainly for the Pendolino and the Super Voyager, must be the tilt mechanism. Yeah, absolutely, Steve. When we go around a, a curve, we want to tilt the body shell so that we can actually compensate for going around that curve a bit faster. Well, it's been a long-held ambition of mine. I've never driven a train. Do you think you could turn me into a driver? Well, we'll give it a chance and we'll see what happens there. Oh, this is it, the chance of a lifetime. Bob is my instructor for the afternoon. Hi, hi, Steve. The Virgin Pendolino Simulator. This is it. Are you ready to go? I'm ready to go if you are. Let's go for it. Let's do it. Well, Colin's in the observation room, setting signals, creating routes. Bob the man who's got to get me out of Nuneaton. Come on, Bob, what do I have to do? Well, before we can move this train, Steve, I've got to go through some of the basic controls. Yep. On the left-hand side, we've got the direction controller. You need to put that into forward. Right. And put your foot on the DSD pedal and keep that depressed all the time. Combine traction brake controller, forward for brake, back for power. Push it down and bring it back into power step one. And we're, we're starting off. to move. Goodbye, Nuneaton. Hello, Tamworth. Should we go a bit faster? Yep. Can I go down? Straight back to power step four. And that's full power. 6,840 horsepower at your fingertips. Fantastic. Now what we've got, we've got the speed supervision light illuminated blue. The tilt not available light has gone out. We're now tilting. Oh, look, the tilt. There we are, Off that's you go it. to the left, there you are. And that's OK, the tilt will take this speed. In fact, it's taking, what, 100 miles an hour now? Oh, hang on, mate, what's happened here? Change your weather. Change your weather. Nothing to worry, we can deal with that. Should I not be slowing off a little bit? No, okay. no, you can... This is where your root knowledge comes in. I'll tell you what, the seasons change quick here, don't they? What's happened now? They do in the West Midlands. Yeah. That's what it's like. It's, <laughs> and the fog's cleared, but we've still got the snow. Right, we're doing one, two, five. We're going to continue to increase speed. We're going to get a task warning. And that should come in at one, two, eight and a half. Right, we're just about getting to one thirty. There we are. There's Oops. your warning. OK, but we're going to ignore that right, and okay. continue to accelerate. And I'll show you what happens. When you get to six mile an hour above, you'll get an intervention. And then you'll get an emergency brake application. So we're just doing one thirty now. And back to normal conditions. That snow cleared quick, didn't it? And there's your intervention. You're no, no longer in control of the train. So that shows you how TAS works. 
Right, can you see Tamworth Station? I can see Tamworth Station. I can see some people waiting to get on as well. They look pleased to see me. <laughs> we'll wait till we get there, <laughs> shall we? <laughs> if you'd like to start putting the brake on, if you don't stop, they won't be very happy at all. Possibly step two. That's your speed supervision dropped off because we've come off the main line. Oh, they do look pleased. I'm surprised. There we go. <laughs> so just take the brake off. So coasting into the station. Just coasting into the station now. There we are. Select neutral. Yeah. No more than 30 mile an hour, please, because okay. we're coming back out onto the fast line. And all the time these are... Oh. So lift, lift your foot oh. and down again. So I went for everything at the same That's time. Right. I wasn't yeah. sure what to press first. Hello? Right. What's this? Emergency brake, please, Steve. Goodness me, look at that. And hit the plunger. That's not an everyday occurrence. What was that? What was it? It was a tree. In fact, it was two trees, OK? So I'm coming to an emergency stop, am I? You're coming to an emergency stop. I've never seen a train driven like that before in all my life, see, that was atrocious. Do you really think I should...? 11 million pounds worth of train. Should I stick to the day job? I think you better stick to the day job, don't I? Now, I did say the simulator was the closest I was going to get to driving a train, but here at Carlisle, I'm going to go one better. I'm going out on a driver training day, and I'm actually going to get in the cab of a real tilting pendolino. I wasn't expecting to see you here. I thought you were just the simulator man. Steve, I'll go anywhere. Simulator yesterday, the real thing today, pretty similar, I've got to say. It is similar, it's got to be similar. A lot of money has been spent on the simulator to get it, the feel of it exactly the same as the real thing. Alex been on the simulator, this is his first turn at the real thing. We're now doing 110 mile an hour in tilt mode. And what's he looking out for? What's, what should he be feeling? Right, he'll feel the tilt as we go in now into this right-hand curve. Yep. He's monitoring all the instruments, the dials and everything. The important thing, he's looking out the window, obviously, at this sort of speed, things can happen very quickly. He's got to deal with that. He's got to deal with anything that that's thrown at him in the cab. Obviously, this is a replica of what we had yesterday. Does it feel different for him driving this, or should it feel, feel the same? It should feel pretty similar. The only difference is he's got real-world um, situation. He's got the movement, he's got things passing him at real-world speeds. Um, he's familiar with the route, but this is the first time he will have driven over it in tilt mode. As we come off this right-hand curve, we're getting an even tighter one round to the left. I can see it now. And we're just about to go into a, a six degree to the left. And over Ooh, we go. Oh, there you go. You don't really feel it much, though, do you? You can feel a gentle move, but there's no... It is a smooth transition. Yeah. It, it's, it's very good, very impressive. And how long does it take a driver to acclimatise to these new trains? The drivers from uh, coming off the conventional trains, they will get four weeks training. They get a week in the class and three weeks out with an instructor like myself, actually in and out to drive it. And also some of the systems, faults and failures out of vector by faults. And obviously this setup, a lot more computerised than some of the trains that they've been used to? Tremendously more computerised. The main computer there for the driver is what we call the train management system, TMS screen. And how exciting is it for drivers to be working on trains like this? I'd like to think it's exciting. I'm an instructor. That's my job, to make it as exciting as possible. Um, we get different reactions from drivers. Um, one, of the old and one of the old and drivers summed it up to me beautifully the other week. He said, when I started on the railway, I was shoveling coal into a firebox and now you're asking me to put my pain number into a computer. And that's the level of change we've had over the years. It's a lovely cab and they're taking to it very positively. Lee West, your press officer with Virgin Trains, must be very proud to be bringing tilting back to the main line. Oh, we all are at Virgin. We're absolutely delighted. It's um, something we've been working hard at now for the best part of seven years and today you can see exactly what it's all about. Well, this is all very exclusive, isn't it? We haven't got passengers on board today. What's going on? Well, what we're on today is a training train. So we've got a driver who's actually learning to drive the train while it's tilting. 
we also use these trains as a way of monitoring the train's performance while it's tilting, so we have an engineer on board who's got his laptop downloading various bits of information, and it's also a way of testing the track equipment, so it's basically testing out all elements of tilt. So how do we get this smooth leaning sensation? Well, it all starts from a device on the track called a Belize, which sends a message to the train, basically instructing it um, what sort of speed the train should be doing and how much it should be tilting by. There's a gyroscope at the front of the train, and what that does is then it will send a message to each individual carriage down the train so that when we reach a curve, each carriage knows when it should tilt, how much it should tilt by, so that you go around the curve smoothly. It's a bit like a motorcyclist at a Grand Prix. You see them take a chicane and they lean and their knee goes close to the ground. It's the same principle in that just by tilting those six degrees, you can take a corner at maybe 10, 15 miles an hour quicker than you would in a conventional train. And what kind of journey time savings are you hoping to see? A good example is probably between Manchester and London, where at the moment it's about two and three quarter hours. And from September of 2004, we expect to be doing that in two hours, five minutes. On top of that, because we'll be able to run the trains faster, we can run more trains. So again, going back to Manchester, at the moment, the peak time service is one train an hour. That will go to one train every 30 minutes. So it's almost turn up and go. And this is all down to that little tilt. Absolutely. In order to demonstrate the longevity of service of the loco we're going to see today, I've had to make a musical comparison. When they were introduced to the network, Bobby Darren was at number one with Mac the Knife, and they powered their way through Beatlemania, glam rock and punk rock, working hard as well, powering freight trains and passenger trains the length and breadth of Britain. But who in the music business had a career like that? Well, ladies and gentlemen, may I present to you the Tom Jones of the loco world, The Peaks. Although the Class 45s and 46s were nicknamed Peaks, it was the Class 44s that were the original stars. I visited the Nottingham Heritage Transport Centre to track down one of the last of these legends. Uh, Mike Kerry, you're Chairman and Director of the Peak Locomotive Company. Um, can you tell us about the 44s? They were originally only 10 built, weren't they? Yeah, they were. They were uh, D1 to 10 were built at Derby Loco Works, just over the road there. 20 miles away in the uh, end of the 1950s, 1958, 59. They were really a prototype class, you might say, because D1 to 10 were just 2,300 horsepower locos, and at the time they were built, they were uh, the most powerful single-engine locos in Europe because you've got one big 12-cylinder Salzer engine made in Switzerland. And Peak, I suppose, is just a nickname for them because they were named after mountains in England and Wales. <laughs> That's right, yeah. I mean, D1 was Scarfell Pike, which is the highest mountain in England in the Lake District, and uh, D10, at the end of the class, is the second highest mountain in uh, Wales. And they went through D2 is Hell Valley, which is the second highest mountain in England, and D4, Great Gable, is the fourth highest. And this is what we're in. We're in the cab of Great Gable at the moment. Yes. Yeah. Were they originally used for passenger trains? Because they ended up on freight, didn't they? And then they went into passenger service straight away on the West Coast Main Line that's now famous for Virgin Trains, uh, London to Glasgow. And because there was only 10 of them, the bigger classes of more powerful locos that follow were able to bump them from the, the, the kind of top link. If you're from the East Midlands, do you have this like affinity with the peaks? I think that's going to be the true of uh, anywhere throughout the land. You, you, you get a... a an affinity with your local classes of trains, those that you grow up with. I mean, I grew up with these and spent my Saturday mornings down at uh, Nottingham Station watching things like this. So, yeah, that, that's where the interest comes from. So we're not going to get a chance to get this one up and running today? No, not today. It takes, uh, um, I don't know, three or four blokes, probably a day to get it to go because the locos don't take kindly to antifreeze, so we store them over the winter, we sheet them over, we drain all the water out and uh, leave them alone for four or five months. Unfortunately, we can't... Uh, warm it up for you and show you it running. So I can't see a peak running today? You can see a peak running today. Later on, we're hopefully running the 45 and the 46 up at the Midland Railway at Butterley. So uh, if they're behaving themselves, I can show you them quite easily. Fantastic. They smell the same. Right, so here we are then uh, at uh, Butterley. This is the Midland Railway Centre. Yeah, Butterley Station. And this is um, the western end of the line almost, and uh, it's a three and a half mile branch line in Derbyshire. 
And this is, uh, is this a 45 or a 46? This is uh, 45041 Royal Tank Regiment. And they're all named after regiments, really, with the exception of Lytham St. Anne's, which was uh, nobody's got to the bottom of, really. Now, you've got a 46 up in the depot. Yeah. Can I get up to the depot and see the 45 and 46 next to each other? Yeah, we can ride up on this one and go and have a look. Fantastic, thanks very much. Mike, here we are then. We've got an example of a 45 Royal Tank Regiment here in D182, the 46 there. Yeah. What's the fundamental difference between the two locos? They're exactly the same, except the Class 45's got Crompton Parkinson electrical equipment, and when they went out of business, the Class 46's which followed in the build line were built with brush electrical equipment. And that's the only difference? That's it. Because I noticed the 45 was built at and the 46 at Derby. Yeah, all the 46ers are built at uh, Derby up until uh, the beginning of 1963, and the 45 bill was split between uh, Derby and Crew. Right, and how many pigs were built altogether? 193, including the 10 Class 44s. And how many are preserved up and down the country, do you know? Oh, gosh. 10, 11, 12. I'll have to look at my book. All right, OK. <laughs> are they susceptible to breaking down? Oh, well, yeah, we've had a problem with the tank regiment today where it wouldn't take power. There's a niggling little problem simply because they, don't, they only get occasional use. So, well, as Tom Jones said, it's not unusual. <laughs> So if you were to compare yourself to a rock star, then who do you think it would be? Oh, uh, probably Brian Adams. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, course. how about you? Um, I don't know, I've always thought I resembled Prince a bit, actually. Prince? You've got to be joking. Why not? Your hair's all wrong. Stay with us for another premiere show next here on h &L as we check out Britain's best builds. Which one gets your vote?